Joining me today is author LJ Vantera. She's here today to talk about her book, Beyond the Wall. Welcome, LJ. Well, thank you very much, Christine. You know, congratulations on your book. Oh, thanks. Yes, and, and how does it feel to be published? Well, it feels a bit surreal. Um, you know, there's lots of things you can do in life and uh, never think that you can't. Uh, if you want to try something, give it a try. Well, you did it, and congratulations. Thank you. So, tell us about the book. Well, the setting is uh, Future Earth. And um, Earth, the planet Earth, has been colonized by inhabitants from another planet. Um, and human beings are essentially turned into farm animals. Yes. So, that's the grand setting, uh, but the micro setting takes place in a compound. Mm. A compound where humans live, and uh, most of the inhabitants have never been outside in the real world. All they know is their compound. Mm. Uh, there are some inhabitants within the compound that lived in the outside world before colonization took place. Uh, they're known as the originals. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes for a, a very interesting setting. Yes, indeed. And yeah. it's such an imagination. So what was the inspiration behind the book? Well, I wanted to um, nudge readers uh, to reflect on, you know, how they treat other beings, whether it's other human beings or non-humans. Um, so I think the, the book itself gently provokes people to, to give that some thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I had some further inspiration. I was once in Savannah, uh, Georgia, and just happened upon a, an open house they were having. And I was intrigued by this film I saw called Inverso Mundus, World Upside Down. So the social norms as, as we know them mm -hmm. are turned upside down. So for example, um, you would see a scene of a human carrying a donkey on its back, yes. or a pig in an apron butchering a human. Mm. Uh, so th there are these surreal scenes all done with a soundtrack of classical music. So I was just seeing these images. Yeah. Uh, and I think the film certainly had an impact on me because you th you think about social roles and it just all seems normal to us mm -hmm. but if you suddenly were to inverse them it it's uh startling mm. right so, it makes you think it makes you think yeah yes. but you know the book isn't all deep and heavy <laughs> and uh Actually, it's also a very thrilling, suspenseful, mysterious, riveting novel. So it's an interesting story with several layers. So if a person just wants to read it for an interesting novel, uh, they certainly would, would get a thrill out of it. Um, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so, but there are these subtle layers that um, nudge the reader to, to think about life and how we, we treat other life. Mm -hmm. It offers to the readers a little suspense, science, science fiction, yeah. and hope. Hope, absolutely hope. Um, because, you know, in our world today, um, full of, frankly, misery that we read about on the news and 
uh, read about lives that other people are having, but there's always hope. So in this story as well, I mean, the setting, yeah. the setting, if I was to explain the setting, it's a setting of despair, but it's also a group living in this compound. It's a community. Um, there are moments of joy and laughter. Um, then there's um, collaboration, um, thinking of a way to escape, and then the planning and the resilience and the drive. Mm -hmm. And um, don't want to give the whole story away, but <laughs> <laughs> ultimately, um, you know, very happy ending. Yes. So, you know, just like life, um, this story, you know, the environment is not, not the best. But as the story shows, you can be in an environment that you think, well, how will I ever get out of this environment? How, how did I get this lot in life? Um, I don't see any change for the future, but the story clearly shows that there's always hope. Yes. And there's always the possibility of change in the future. Yes. Yeah. When you have hope, you have the the faith to and the belief in yourself that you can do it. Yes. And that's where So what was the process like? Well, as you know, this was my first novel. Mm -hmm. Congratulations Thanks. again. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I'd written, I've always written throughout my life, always poems or songs or things like that, but I never thought I would write a novel. Um, and I thought, well, I'm not going to do the whole thing, but wouldn't it be fun to just, just to write the first page? Just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so I read the first, I wrote the first page and then another, and then I, then I had a chapter and then Christine, it was very strange, but it just came to me. Yeah. Was it, it therapeutic? Yes, yeah. it was. It was like, I, I looked forward to just delving into this and, and crafting it. And I enjoyed the, the editing, the rewriting, rewriting, rethinking. Mm -hmm. Could I write that sentence better? Could I write that paragraph better? Um, and I never knew that I would enjoy that so much. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what about the characters? I mean, how did you develop the characters? Like the Edna, I believe, uh, she's empowering, I believe. <laughs> yeah, just, just like any community of individuals, each character is different. Um, some more vocal than others, some seemingly stronger than others, yeah. and others who have a quieter strength. Mm. Um, so quite a variety of, of characters in the novel, just like in the real world. Yes. Is some of your characteristics you use in the book, some of it, characteristics that you have? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I, I did. I mean, I guess one of the characters in particular, I wouldn't say she's exactly me, but yeah, her, her voice is my voice. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it's, uh, it is a book that, you know, the reviews are great. And, and I want to ask you the feedback without me saying, you know, Canada, yeah. United Kingdom, India. Yeah. So how does that make you feel about the feedback? Well, pretty good. You know, it was a little bit frightening at first, um, even before it was published, um, putting it out there. You know, you just feel so vulnerable. Um, and I hear this from other writers, too. You know, you, you put your heart and soul but into the story, but also this story's a little bit, a little bit out there, right? So I thought, ooh, how are, gonna, how are people going to react to this? setting and um, so I gently 
brought the book out at first. I had a couple of beta readers that were acquaintances and um, I asked them mm -hmm. if they were willing to read it and to give me their thoughts and, yeah. and they enjoyed it very much. Yeah. So then I thought, phew, <laughs> okay, and then I would branch out a little bit further um, to people I, I, I knew and the further I branched out and had people read it and the more positive responses I was getting, I just let lots of people read it. And, <laughs> and, and was, was this year, what year was this when you started? Well, I started writing, I think it was 2019. 2019, okay. Um, but the more challenging part is not the writing, but after you get it done, it's like, okay, what am I going to do with this? Mm. You know, okay, this was an interesting experiment. Uh, now, now I'm done and on to other things in my life. But I thought, well, I went through all the trouble of writing this. Why not? Why not it, yeah. share it? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So I did that. I got it published. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. And it's on Amazon. So. <laughs> yes, it's... Um, it's on Amazon and it's, I'm actually going through a republishing phase as we speak. So um, it's, the first one was just sort of an experiment. It's on Amazon and Goodreads, but I'm going through with another publisher to expand that, get it republished, um, new, new cover design mm -hmm. and expand it a little further. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. LJ, what is the message that you want readers to take away from your book? Well, on the one hand, I just want them to read the story and enjoy it as a story. Mm -hmm. Right? So I'm hoping they find it um, intriguing, good storyline. Hope they enjoy it. I hope they read it cover to cover and <laughs> and enjoy it. On the other hand, um, if to them it um, is thought provoking and, and makes them think about, you know, our world, yes. our society, mm -hmm. how we would like to be treated, how we treat other people. Yeah. Um, if that happens, that's, that's great. That's great. And I have to ask you, will there be a sequel? Well, at this point, I'm saying no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, never say never. But um, no, I think, I think I'll stick with this one for now and yeah. um, hope more people read it first. Yeah. And then we'll see. <laughs> well, it has a happy ending. It does, yeah. It's... I mean, I have an idea for another. Oh book, but I'm just keeping that Stay tuned. <laughs> in my back pocket. It would actually be the same story, but from an, another character's point of view. LJ, if people want to copy the book, where can they go? Well, they can check my website, ljvantera.com, um, and it has information about where they can, they can buy the book. Um, right now, you can just buy it online, but I am in conversation with some independent bookstores. Uh, I won't name them yet because it's not finalized, but I'm hoping to reach some deals with some independent bookstores in, in Vancouver, so we'll see. But for now, um, ljvantera.com. Awesome, and then there'll be the awards. It's oh, <laughs> you're living in a dream world, <laughs> as one of the characters says in the book. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you, Christine. I'm excited to have with me today Felipe Massetti Lett. He's a world renowned long writer, award winning journalist, filmmaker, best selling author, and he's here today to talk about his recent documentary, The Long Writer. Welcome, Felipe. Thank you so much for having me and allowing me to share, share my story. 
Oh my goodness. I mean, I am talking to you and I just saw the film and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, how did you do it? Like <laughs> it is, but I want to start off by, for people who may not know, what is a long writer? What is a long writer? Yeah, for sure. A lot of people have no idea, right? It's a subculture. Uh, a long rider is someone who rides uh, a thousand miles or more consecutively in a single journey. So um, as you saw in the film that I mentioned, some famous long riders of the past, um, Charles Darwin, Marco Polo, uh, Aim Chifley, who inspired my journey. And to this day, there's still uh, lots of people around the world jumping into the saddle and going on their own equestrian uh, journeys. Yeah, so this is your dream since you were a child and I understand your father would read the book by M.A. Um, Chifley. Chifley, sorry. And but it, it all began with with that book, which was 1925, yeah. I understand, was published, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's insane, right, to think that, uh, I know, a story that happened uh, almost a century ago could have inspired someone to uh, to try to emulate it, you know, so many years later. And uh, yeah, my dad used to read me that book every night before I went to sleep. It's called Chifley's Ride. It tells the story of uh, one of the most epic long rides of all time, Aim Chifley. Uh, rode horseback from Argentina to New York in 1925. And I just fell in love with the story. It became my life stream to one day uh, go on my own long ride. Wow. I mean, was there a little moment you said, I want to become a long rider. I mean, were you, where were you? And, and what did it feel like? So I think it was very gradual. Like at first it was just kind of like a kid's dream. You know, I'd be at the farm and my little horse thinking I was the guy traveling across the Americas. And then as I got older, it started to, you know, grow. And I thought about it and thought about it and pondered and wondered if it, it'd be possible to do this in the 21st century. And uh, one day I was in my last year of university at uh, Ryerson in Toronto. And I just, um, I, I went on the internet and started researching and I saw, I found the Long Riders Guild, which is an organization that, you know, puts all these stories together and helps people that want to go on their own journeys. Um, and I got in touch with them and, and they were very helpful with me. And I, I learned that there was people all over the world still going on long rides. And, and that kind of gave me uh, the push that I needed to actually, you know, grab the dream and turn it into a project. Uh, the first thing I did was write it down and, and created a war room in my apartment where I lived and, and started the planning stage, very arduous as well, until I acquired all the know-how and the equipment, the horses and the money that I needed to undertake this journey. Wow. I mean, a lot of uh, preparation and, and it just is so much. So tell us about the process. I mean, um, you know, there was a saddle, they're packing and then I understand there was no water. You forgot to bring water, right? What is that? I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, it, it's so much to, you know, to, to do. And uh, I had to I'd do everything. Like, I had to literally learn how to ride a horse long distance. I, I was comfortable around horses, but it's totally different for you to, you know, rope with a horse or compete and then ride it for eight, 10 hours every day. Um, and so I had to speak to long riders around the world and, and read as much literature as I could find. Uh, the other part of it was getting my body into shape, um, losing weight, working on my core, uh, drawing my route, figuring out, you know, what countries I was going to get across, what the, you know, what the geography was like, social economic um you know everything that was happening in these countries at the time i had to really uh learn and focus and and then the other part was acquiring everything i needed like i said from the horses to the tent to to the i didn't have a single horseshoe so that was the the hardest part i think was convincing people uh to support me and that i'd, I'd actually be able to do this uh, you know in my early 20s but uh luckily i got everything i needed and then on that first day I, in 2012 i managed to ride right out of the calgary stampede Yes. I mean, there's a, I mean, sitting on a horse is one thing and, but being on such long hours, so it would be like 30 kilometers a day you would do like. Yeah, exactly. That's how much you travel a day. You know, it's a, it's a good number for the animal and for the rider as well. And uh, that would take about eight to 10 hours to, to do those 30 kilometers. Oh my goodness. And then, you know, with the, there are you know, moments of bonding with the horses like Brucer um, and Frenchie. And I mean, uh, for people who are watching and like, how 
how did you bond so well with the horses? Like you became like a family, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, they become your kids. They're like yeah. your children. Yeah. An extension of your body and, and there's yours. And that's one of the most uh, special parts of the trip, you know, is actually uh, creating this bond w- with the animals. And it happens because um, you spend so much time around them, you know, it's uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You're eating next to them. You're traveling with them. You're sleeping around them. Um, you know, usually when you have a horse nowadays, you, you leave the horse out in the pasture or or in a stall and you sleep in your bedroom, you know, you know, you're not having this constant connection with the animal. Um, and, and so, yeah, I was, I was a part of the herd and, and they were a part of my, I, I yeah. heard and, and it was such a beautiful, go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, so what drove you, like, I mean, what lessons did you learn? And, and, you know, like, I know I'm asking two questions here, but you're on this journey, incredible journey. And, did you feel a bit of loneliness? Like, how did you mentally be so strong? Yeah, it's tough. You know, I think, I think uh, it helps when you prepare. Like strategic planning um, really helps to, to prepare you both uh, mentally and physically. Uh, the mental aspect of it was definitely by far the hardest. Uh, you got to push, you know, there's moments where you think you're not going to be able to do it. And uh, you just have to continue on. Like you, you touched upon the loneliness um, that's very hard. You know, I, I always say some of the deepest scars I have in my soul came from all the time I spent alone by myself suffering, uh, you know, in the middle of nowhere and, and that stuff that you can't take back. But, um, you know, ultimately it was a huge learning experience. I think that we, as humans, we learn the biggest lessons in our lives when things aren't going well, right? I think when things are going well, they're great to, to motivate us to continue on. But uh, the true lessons come from our mistakes, from from when we hit rock bottom. And and I learned so many lessons from this journey, you know, from the the kindness of humanity to the power of the horse to the to the power of the human spirit when you when you set a goal and are able to focus and and make it happen um you know so i think ultimately i came out of it a much stronger person yeah so no, congratulations and you're also i didn't put in the intro but you're also the youngest long rider to cross the americas and you speak several languages yeah. like spanish um english of course french, french. Jews, and you know having Portuguese in Portuguese like all those languages like do you think that there will be in other languages like, that you uh yeah I love languages you know and it, it's uh it, it was one of the reasons why I was able to um take so much away from this journey you know had I not been able to communicate with the people that were hosting me every 30 kilometers through those 12 nations um it wouldn't have been you know as special as it was that was the the best part was that connection with with uh, with people at the end of every day. You know, you, you really learn how kind humanity is at its core. And and um, yeah, I'd love to learn new languages. I'd, lo- I'd love to I'd love to learn French that you just mentioned. Um, and uh, in Italian, you know, I, I love communicating with people. So for sure. Well, three languages is, is just awesome. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So tell us some of the highlights of, of your journey. Yeah, so I think the highlights were uh, leaving the Calgary Stampede. Like, I fought so hard to take that first step, you know. Like, two years earlier, I was just a crazy kid with a dream that was never going to even leave. So, to be there with those animals that were given to me, the saddle, the back saddle, leaving from the Centennial Stampede uh, was so special, starting that dream. Um, Yellowstone National Park, crossing the backcountry of Yellowstone was was epic, uh, so beautiful. Mexico. No one celebrated my journey like the Mexicans. One day, a thousand horsemen and women uh, saddled their horses and rode with me. And um, I have very fond memories of, of Mexico. Um, Patagonia was uh, life altering. You know, I met my uh, fiance there, asked for help at her house and, uh, and ended up falling in love with her. Uh, the Yukon uh, was the place that um, kind of got under my skin because it was so hard to cross the bears, the, the bugs, the mounds, the bog, but um, at the same time, it, like I, I fell in love with it. Like as hard as it was, it was so beautiful, so rugged, uh, so wild. And then all the indigenous communities I got to cross in the Yukon as well, and, and to learn their their story and and the story of the Americas. Right, we tend to forget that everyone came through a land bridge from Siberia to Alaska and ended up, you know, wandering down on their epic journeys uh, all the way to the southern part of of Argentina and, and colonizing this this continent before the Europeans arrived. But yeah, you know, there was so many special moments of this journey and uh, yeah, people get to see it in the movie now, like you saw it. So that's awesome. Yes. yes and to see, to be 
you know, on horseback to see the world. Like, you know, it's such an, uh, you know, what, what a, a great way, you know, and but any regrets though? Um, uh, you know, I don't really believe in regrets. I think we all do something for a reason, regardless of what the outcome, I think that it's already written and we're just going through the motions. You know, it feels like nothing less than my destiny to have gone on this journey. So, um, you know, as hard as it was, and I, like I said, I have scars that I carry with me. Some things that, you know, I take with me from the journey were good and some were bad. Uh, but I wouldn't take it back because it's made me who I am today. And, and I was supposed to go on this journey. This was my, uh, this was my purpose in life. It was my path. And I was just following my instincts. Yes. And what is next for you? So right now we are uh, traveling the world with the documentary, which is awesome. Been the film festivals and from Hollywood to India, uh, we won four awards already. So the documentary is, is doing really well on the international film festival circuit. We'll continue that till the end of the year. Um, I'm in Calgary right now. I, I work with the Calgary stampede. I'll be, uh, uh, riding in the parade. I was the um, parade marshal in 2020 when I finished my last journey. And this year I'll be the honorary marshal along with uh, Kevin Costner, which is going to be awesome. I work on the broadcast team uh, with the tie down roping. We broadcast uh, Sportsnet in Canada, uh, Cowboy Channel in the US, and then in Brazil, uh, Brazil Rural TV. So that's going to be really cool as well. And I just finished writing my third book, uh, Last Long Ride, which will be coming out uh, pretty soon here on the last uh, part of the journey. And we're working on a feature film. Uh, based on the first book, Long Ride Home, uh, about my first journey from Canada to Brazil. So we'll probably start shooting that next year. It'll be with actors and actresses, and uh, we'll retell the story uh, of the first ride through that narrative version. So super excited for that. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, and congratulations. And I'd love to do another interview with you, you know, and maybe in six months or, you know. Yeah, for yeah. sure, for sure. That would be awesome. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you.